uh, with uh, teaching, how do we teach students critical thinking? And so to that end, we urge you introducing Professor Rodney Schmaltz. He's an associate professor at McEwen University in Edmonton, uh, Alberta, Canada. His research focuses on pseudoscientific thinking with an emphasis on strategies to promote and teach scientific skepticism. And he's co-authored two introductory psychology textbooks. So uh, Dr. Schmaltz strives to better understand why people believe in strange things like ghosts, aliens, or psychic powers, and works to find strategies to help combat these beliefs. Here to share those strategies, Professor Schmaltz.
Now, why might this be? We think part of the problem is that kids are told all the time that they're learning about critical thinking. But with those definitions, you could be learning about almost anything. So what we propose is that we should put a focus on scientific thinking. The ability to generate, test, and evaluate claims, data, and theories. Now, I know you might be thinking, okay, that's just another definition, right? But we can be very specific on this. I look at the work of Scott Lillianfeld, and he says there's basically six principles of scientific thinking. We can expand on this too, but it's a good starting point. So, things like ruling out rival hypotheses, the idea of correlation is equal causation, falsifiability, the need for replicability, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and Occam's razor. We think, at the very least, when high school students leave, they should be familiar with these terms. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, um, with this group, how many people learned about this in high school? Anybody? Couple? Yeah. Okay, a few. Maybe five or six. So, in our experience, we've been looking at a lot of curriculums, it's just simply not being taught. Now, okay, again, you're a teacher, you're told you have to do this. Well, now what? So how are we going to do that? It's not part of the curriculum, and there's not a lot of good tools out there. So we're trying to build one. Building on the work of Carl Sagan, we're thinking about framing this like a baloney detection kit. For a couple reasons. One, we want this to be very simple. Just a tool that we can give to teachers that they can easily implement. We want to show that it's effective. And two, it's engaging. If a student's told, today you're going to learn about critical thinking, some might be interested, some not. But tell that same group of students they're going to learn how to detect bullshit. <laughs> Wait a second, that's a little bit more interesting. And if you're at a more conservative school, the loading works just as good, but it might not quite grab their attention as much. So, how are we doing this? Uh, we created this hour long lecture, and we're trying to validate the efficacy of this. It involves three demonstrations, and these demonstrations hit on those scientific thinking principles. Uh, the first one we're using is a demonstration of astrology. So it's basically for a sketch. Um, what we've done is we get all the kids' names, just their first names. We tell them that we look up their birth dates. We have it. And then we have a personality prediction based on their astrological sign. And as everyone knows who's familiar with the Foyer sketch, all the kids in the class get the same description. So they read it, they're asked, how much does this seem to be you? They all say, very similar to who I am, and they learn, they all have the same description. We've got a really interesting card trick. I don't have time to show it to you now, but basically the way it works is there's a card in their hands, you tap their hand, it appears that the card has changed. Uh, Nicole DeBat, just going to stand up for a second. Nicole's got a deck of cards, so if you want to learn it after, she'll show you. It's, it's a really quick and easy one, it's a good one. And then we've also got a newspaper psychic prediction. You might be familiar with this one as well, but just really quickly, you get a newspaper, you cut a long column out, then you take some scissors, move up and down, and somebody says for a stop, you cut it. There's a number of ways to do this then. Uh, I usually have an envelope in the back of the room. I have a student pick up where I cut, they read it, and then magically, at the back of the room, they read the same sentence. So I have students predict where they would make the cut. And again, we go into more detail on how that's done. Very, very simple demonstrations. And in fact, the last one showed up on Penny Teller's Blue List. <laughs> Believe it or not, and it did not fool them. <laughs> These demonstrations were crafted looking at best practices in educational psychology, cognitive psychology. Um, Nicole nor I are magicians, so we have consulted with magician Tony Barnhart. We're trying to get these really engaging examples that will drive home these ideas. Now, this is just a single shot lecture, but we think it's so interesting that the students might want to show their friends. They've learned a couple of cool magic tricks. Maybe that will spill over and they'll start talking more about it. So we're measuring this. Uh, not easy to do. <clears throat> we're using the revised Bruno belief scale. It's a seven point scale. Um, it has questions like uh, astrology is a way to accurately predict the future. We're looking at trust in science and scientists. Things like scientists who can intentionally keep their work secret. And critical thinking measures, especially at this age group, are tough. A lot of them are very expensive, a lot of them are validated. We found a fairly good one, it's called the Psychological Critical Thinking Test. It has questions like um, a description of what a psychic detective does, and then 
is this claim valid? Things like that. Uh, I mentioned it's adapted because we simplify the language. The kids group testing between grades 8 and 10. So, we got into a school. We sent out 300 consent forms for the parents to sign. So we're going to talk about our first 33 data points, because that's what we got back so far. I'm just going to talk about the baseline, and it's going to be really risky in this audience, and I need to give you an anecdotal example as well. But, at least in this very small sample, uh, the belief in paranormal, we just summed it against in time. Uh, there's a lot of subscales, but for the sake of time. Uh, seven would be the highest you could score on that scale. The kids average somewhere in the middle of 3.38. Trust in science, the highest you could score is five. The highest score meaning higher trust, not bad, 3.5. And the critical thinking measure, the best you could do is 21, and they average about six. So, what we're hoping is that after kids see this demonstration, belief in the paranormal goes down, trust in science goes up, critical thinking goes up as well. Now, some classes did get the demonstrations. We're comparing uh, entire classes. And the way we did this is we'd show the entire class the demonstration, but only the kids who brought back consent forms filled out the measures. So our little bit of anecdotal evidence. With this demonstration, what we're hoping is that it will generalize to things like psychics and charlatans, and turn of medicine, all the things we've been talking about for the last couple of days. And one of the kids put their hand up after our demonstration and said, so, my mom uses crystals. Is that like this? <laughs> oh, we hope everyone's like you. <laughs> so, we hope. We hope. Well, this research is tough. Um, Nicole and I spent eight or nine months just getting things together to get into a school, a school, one. And uh, we balanced with our research ethics board. Um, obviously, we've been having problems getting consent forms back. Our research ethics board is actually really interesting. They, they wanted to meet with us because they had some issues. And there's all kinds of issues working with um, people under the age of 18 and the lady confidentiality, all kinds of stuff. But their issue was this. The scale we use has a question, I believe in God, and there are also questions, I believe in the Loch Ness Monster. People on the REB wondered why those questions would be together. <laughs> when they first proposed that, Nicole and I didn't even really understand what they meant. Because they said, so, if you say here, I believe in God, then just down the road, you talk about the Loch Ness Monster. Yes? Silence, staring, awkwardness. Well, as a Christian and a scientist, oh, there it is. Okay, I got it. <laughs> so we had to convince them this is a validated scale, and they allowed us to use it. It's hard to find measures that work for kids. Uh, we've had to adapt that critical thinking measure. And we are competing with profit-driven organizations. We've looked at a lot of the organizations that supposedly promote critical thinking. It is expensive. It might be $500 or less, and I'm not sure what the school board's paying. But there is no mention of scientific thinking in there. None of the things we've talked about today, none of the things that have been discussed at this conference, none of that's in there. So those companies are making a lot of money using tools that we don't think fit any of those definitions of critical thinking, and they don't appear to be validated either. So why is it important? Well, all we really want is when the kids get through these demonstrations, they will know not to take uh, the bus from celebrities. Woo. They will learn that there are people who will take advantage of grief for money, yeah. for lives, and just to avoid other assorted nonsense. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.